Welcome to this video on bisection. In this video, we are first going to state a property that continuous functions have, and that property will be the intermediate value theorem. And that can help us to find zeros of such functions. So in many applications, you're interested for functions where they become zero. So for which x values do you have that f of x equals zero? In particular, I will be looking at building a reflector. So the green object that you see here is a reflector. The red straight lines here are light rays and they are being reflected by this mirror that has a parabolic shape and they all go through a focal point F here after being reflected. So I will study with you how you could build such a reflector. And as we are doing that, we will generalize it a little bit to find the zero of a continuous function using a simple numerical algorithm called bisection. So let's go. First intermediate value theorem. And there is quite a lot here, but intuitively, it is not very complicated. So say we have a function y is f of x, and we will assume that it is continuous on some interval a, b. Now, the idea is that if you look at the function at the two endpoints, so at a, it has the value f a, and then here at the other endpoint of the interval at b, it has the function value f b. So on the vertical axis, we have f b and f a. And what it says now, the intermediate value theorem, is that if you pick any value u in between f a and f b, that there is a corresponding x value for that. So basically, since you cannot lift your pen from the paper when, you draw, when you're drawing the graph, if you start here and you need to go in some way without lifting your pen from the paper up here, then basically you cross all the intermediate values here on the y-axis. So that is what the function tells you. So let's see in formulas, we have a continuous function. And either we have that f a is less or equal f b, and then we can pick a value in between. Or it's the other way around, that's not corresponding to the picture, but it could also be that your function is going down. So then you have that f b is less or equal f a, and we pick a u in between. Then you can find an original, say, so a C on the X axis, such that F of C equals U. So in words, F takes on every value between F A and F B at least once, maybe more times. Eh? You could have a function that does this. And then if you take a line like this, you see that it crosses it multiple times, but at least once. Okay. So that is the intermediate value theorem. All the intermediate values are being attained by the function. As a special case, you could imagine that if the function is negative at one end of the interval and positive at the other interval, so here it is negative at A and positive at B, or the other way around, so here positive at A and negative at B, then if it is a continuous function, it has to cross all the intermediate function values, y values, in particular zero. So zero is in between there. So it means that your function has a zero in the interval. There is an alpha, at least one that can be multiple, for which f of alpha equals zero. Now, finding such zero is an important problem, and there are many algorithms to do so. What I will show you is one problem that I'm going to model mathematically, and that will lead to finding a zero of a function. So say that we would like to build a parabolic antenna. So the surface is a parabola that you rotate around the main axis. So here you see a picture. This is a photo of a radio antenna. And here you see um, a, a, a parabolic reflector that reflects light rays. And you've probably seen them. If you ever been to the Science Museum in Amsterdam, Nemo, there are two of these huge disks when you get in there, uh, quite far from each other. And if there is two of you and one goes to the first reflector, and if you talk at the center, then your 
sound waves, we have seen that sound are pressure waves, is being reflected like this and it travels to the other side of the museum. So if your friend is there listening at the focus point of the other reflector, then he or she can hear you talking due to um, this property. And you also know it, there are many more applications, but you also know it, for instance, from telescopes or car lights or the light on your bike or maybe microphones. They all have properties like this. So how can you build such a thing? Well, the way you build it is that you take a plaster and a metal template and that you first make a negative from this plaster. Then you coat this with some kind of polyester, so a type of plastic, and you let that dry. Then you take it off and then you uh, put a coating on that, a reflecting layer that reflects the rays that you're interested in. Now, the way that this, this metal shape is made, that you need to make your plaster to get it into the right form, is using a milling device. And a milling device, that's just a little wheel, a little disc, that cuts the right shape out of the metal. And the way that you control these things, so here the gray wheel, I've, I've drawn it at multiple positions, and you see that if you move it from one position to the other, that you can cut out a kind of parabolic shape here. The way you control these devices is that basically you give the center point, you give multiple coordinates, you build a list with, um, so this is the center point, and say that it has it starts at position x1, y1, and then you tell the milling device to move it to x2, y2, and then you tell it to move to x3, y3, and so on. So you give it a list of coordinates that it should put this little wheel to, and then it cuts out the material. And if you prescribe the right coordinates, then you get the shape that you want. Now the difficulty is that if you would like this to be a parabola, then that center is not going to follow a parabolic orbit. So what we have is given the radius of this milling device, or the gray wheel that you prescribe, and the parabola that you would like to cut, and you can characterize a parabola by the focal length, that you would like to compute the orbit of the center of this milling device, of this mill. So in mathematical terms, you have to compute the orbit of the center of a circle of radius r when it's moving along a parabola with this uh, formula. So a parabola with focal length r, uh, f sorry, has this equation. So y equals x squared over 4f. f is just some number. If you take f equal 1, you would find so f is 1 then you find y is x squared over 4. And then basically what that tells you is that if you have this uh, parabola, so y is x squared over 4, then the light rays are being reflected and they all go through 1 on the vertical axis. So that is what it tells you. And in general, this point here is f on the vertical axis, the focal point, if you take this formula. So that's what it says here. So let's, let's try to, to write this down once more as a mathematical model. So here's a little picture. We want to cut out this parabola here. y is x squared over 4f. And then we have a point where the circle touches the parabola, and that is as coordinates x, p, and y, p. And then what we would like to know is what is the position of this center point here. So we have a circle with midpoint x, m, y, m. We have a contact point with coordinates x, p, y, p. And what I would really like is to have a formula that gives y, m as a function of x, m because those are the coordinates that I have to feed into my milling device. I have to build a list 
using this. To find a direct formula is not easy, and I'll try and convince you why. So let's look at a couple of formulas. We know that the midpoint of this circle plus the contact point have a distance little r, because that's the radius of the milling device. So that leads to this equation. Then additionally, I know that I can draw here the tangent line in blue, and then if I draw this red line that is perpendicular to that, then I know that both the center point and this contact point are on the red line. That's going to give me a second equation. So how can I do that? Well, this, this blue line here has a slope that equals the derivative, that's x over 2f for the function that we have here, at xp. So the blue line has this slope, xp over 2f. The red line, let's call that y equals ax plus b. I know that they make a 90 degree angle here. So that means that this a, this slope here, times this slope here equals, hopefully you recall from earlier videos, minus 1. So I have that a times xp over 2f equals minus 1. And then I also know that it goes through the contact point. So that gives me a second equation. And then I know that the center of the circle, so this point here, should also be on the red line, and that's going to give me an additional equation. So what do we have? We can rewrite that to this formula and this formula. And they look quite complicated. And what you see especially is that there is no direct relation between ym and xm. So I would like to have ym as a function of xm, but that, that, that's not just not working there, because this xp is still in there. So what can we do? Well, what we're going to do is we look at this formula and we say that apparently xp in red here should satisfy this equation. In other words, I can take some value for xm. I can try and find a zero of this function and then the zero of that function satisfies this equation. So it is xp, so that is a way to find xp. And once I have both xm and xp, I can compute using this formula here, the corresponding ym value. So with a couple of steps, a bit technical, but not extremely difficult, high school mathematics, we have seen how you can find the orbit of the center of that wheel. Let's generalize a little bit. So basically what we're trying to do now or what we hope to find is a method to find a zero of a function. And sometimes that is easy. So for general functions, if you have a straight line, you can easily do that. If you have a parabola, then you know this formula. So you have an explicit formula also. Um, but sometimes even for quite simple functions, so for instance, 2x times e to the power x minus 1, if you want to find a zero there, you will not find an analytical solution. You can do it numerically, but you cannot solve that by hand and find an explicit formula. So what I'm going to do is sketch a first numerical method and later on in later video, I will sketch a better, faster method too. But this one uses this intermediate value theorem. So let's see. First, you have to do a little bit of work and you have to find an interval a, b, such that f has opposite signs. So f a is less than zero and f b is bigger than zero or the other way around, okay? Um, so here we have that f is negative at the left end of the interval, positive at the right end of the interval. Then you know by the intermediate value theorem that it has to cross the horizontal axis. So there needs to be at least one zero in this interval. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the middle of the interval. So here this m is the average of a and b, a plus b over 2. It's right in the middle of the interval. And I'm going to check whether the function is positive, negative, or zero there. Now here in my picture, you see that the function is positive. So what I can now do is I can shrink the size of the interval 
and I can consider this smaller interval from A to M. And I know that alpha still needs to be in that interval. So I can make the interval a little bit smaller. Now, if I would have found that Fm is less than zero, so that does not correspond to the picture, then I could have shifted my left point of the interval. And if f of m would be zero, I would be very lucky because then I would have found a zero of the function. And now the main idea is that after this first step, you can repeat it. So you just, so you've cut the interval in two pieces and you continue with the interval that still contains the zero. So let's look at an example here. So this function, x squared minus 3, that's just a parabola, right? So you just have like this, y equals x squared minus 3. Here is 1, 0, and here is the other one. So here you, you can actually find them. And let's try and find numerically this zero here. So I call that alpha. I'm going to try and find alpha using this bisection algorithm. So first, if you punch it into a calculator or your computer, you see that square root of three is approximately 1.73. If you look at F zero, you see that your function is negative. In 2, the function is positive. So apparently 0, 2 should contain um, alpha. And indeed, of course, you see that that holds true. And then I just build this table here. So I'm going from 0, 2. I look at the middle, which is 1. I compute f of 1, which is minus 2. Since it is negative, I move the point a to 1. b is still 2. The new midpoint is 1.5, and I find, again, something negative. So I shift A to 1.5, B remains at 2. The new one is 1.75, and now you see that our function is positive. And if it is positive, I need to shift the B to the middle. So B shifts now to 1.75, new midpoint, and so on. So you see, if you go down here, that the distance between A and B gets smaller and smaller because the length of the interval is being halved all the time. And you also see that the M, the midpoint, is slowly converging towards the limit of 1.73. And you also see that the F value, the function value, slowly goes to zero if you go down in this table. You need quite a few steps here to get a good accuracy. So I will sketch a better, smarter, faster method later on. For now, I would like to wrap up by going back to my example of the parabolic antenna. So I chose some values. This is my milling device, the, the, the size of, of, of the milling wheel. This is the um, focal distance I would like the parabola to have. And to get this list of coordinates, I'm picking 0, 4, 8, and so on. And for every value of x, m, I first find x, p using bisection. So zero of the function f. Then I compute the corresponding y, m, and then I plot it. And if green is here your parabolic antenna, then these are positions of the milling device. And you see that the black curve goes right through the centers here. And that looks like a parabola, but it is not. So what I did here in, in, in the red dashed line here that you see, that is the green parabola, but just shift it to show that the black line is not a parabola, but it's kind of hard to see there. So that wraps up this video. Let's see, what have we seen? So we have shown that a continuous function on an interval takes on all the intermediate y values. That's called the intermediate value theorem. We can use that to find a numerical method to find zeros of a continuous function. And then finally, we made a mathematical model for a milling process. So I hope you liked this and that it made clear what you can do using continuity of a function. I will come back to the problem of finding zeros of functions numerically. But that wraps it up for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.